I want to welcome you to our worship today. You notice a little change of scenery. We are now in purple. And so that is the indication that Lent has finally arrived with Ash Wednesday. And so we hope that you are uh, starting a good season of contemplation and devotion. It's an opportunity for you to add things. If you want to take away anything, don't worry about the candy or the coffee or those types of things that are really nonsensical. Unless you really want to, that's fine. What I would suggest that you take away from your life is maybe the anger that you have for other people. Get rid of that. That would be a good thing to purge from your life. Maybe it's the impatience that you have with other people. That would be a good thing to get rid of. So if you want to fast something, fast your anger. Fast your impatience. Take on disciplines of Lent, acts of charity and love and kindness for others. Understanding. Prayer, devotional opportunities. These are the things that we are called to do during this season as we reflect upon the great gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ. So again, we're reminding ourselves that Christmas is just the beginning. Easter is the true season in which we live, and so we give thanks for that. All right, so just a couple other announcements. Remember, we are worshiping live and in person every Sunday at 10 a.m., if you're able and wanting to come down, you're welcome to. But once again, we do ask that you wear a mask. And so even as those of us uh, start getting our uh, vaccines, you're still required and requested to wear a mask. Because remember, the person you're protecting is those around you. And so even a person who's received a vaccine can still be a carrier and therefore get someone else sick. And we don't want to bring that into this congregation until... We are all feeling safe and secure. So, you're welcome to come. You're required to wear a mask. We do expect people to distance from one another. We ask that the sanctuary be reserved as a quiet place for everything except for worship. And during worship, we do not sing during our worship services while you're here, although we do have music. And we do invite you to come down and be a part. It's a half an hour service. Holy Communion is celebrated as a part of that. Reminder again, if you're not comfortable coming down, but you do want to receive communion, you're welcome to show up here at the sanctuary every Sunday at 9 a.m. And I'd be very happy to give you and your family group Holy Communion uh, prior to the worship service. So that's what's going on Tuesdays. We do have a special Compline service. You're welcome to come down at that for that at 7 p.m. Again, it's a half an hour long. Communion is a part of that. There is a short Bible study every single Tuesday night as well, too. You're welcome to view both of those things online. Obviously, you're watching our worship service, but I encourage you to tune in to our Tuesday night uh, Bible study. All right, we're here to worship God. You know the deal about the giving and opportunities to give as far as the congregation goes, and we collect the food for the residents in the community. I'd be grateful for any donations you, you make. I mention that quite often. I'm not going to go into that today because I would like to get to worship, as I'm sure you would as well, too. So let's begin our service today with a confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God of all mercy, we, we confess, confess that we have sinned against you, you opposing, opposing your will, will in our, our lives. lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will. Amen. God is generous to all who ask for help. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Let us sing together opening hymn.
with an everlasting love, who brings forth a new creation in Jesus Christ, who leads us by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. Grace and abundant mercy be with you all. And also with you. God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood, you saved the chosen, and in the wilderness of temptation you protected your Son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked uh, foe may have no power over us, through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first lesson for today is found in the book of 1 Peter, the third chapter. St. Peter writes, For Christ also suffered for sins once and for all, the righteousness for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in the former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were saved through the water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you, 
not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, the angels, authorities, and the powers made subject to him. Here ends the lesson. We read responsibly today the 25th Psalm. Congregation may respond as the indicated. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me, Lead me in your truth, truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be and mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for hey, they have been formed of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or of my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. gospel lesson is found in the book of Mark, the first chapter. Glory be to you, O Lord. Now in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, he immediately saw the heavens opened up like a spirit descending on him like a dove. A voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. He was then with wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee and preached the gospel of God and said, The time is now fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts to you today and ask you to continue to, to grind away at our un, unwilling hearts. For oftentimes we've turned our backs upon you, but we ask that you continue to be patient with us and bring us near to you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, for those following online, there is a handout for today's lesson. You're welcome to download that from our Facebook pages, the advertisement for the service for today. Our lesson is entitled, Finding Our Identity. And where do you think we're going to find our identity? Boy, I'll tell you, we try to put our identity in so many different things. Political leaders kind of always fails on us, doesn't it? Because they don't really care about you. We try to find our identity in the brands of clothing that we wear. But you know what? Sometimes we way overpay for products that really cost a fraction of the price. We just pay for a label. Do we really find our identity in those types of things? Or how about the material possessions that we have? The big houses that we buy. You know, my, my home where I grew up in, Peters Township at Murray, PA, uh, it was, at the time when I grew up there, a, a rural area and a few housing areas. But now, it's of these big, huge, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars for a house on these small postage stamp size plots of land. They're, they're trophy houses, basically, for people who want to show off how wealthy they are. I know I'm really being indicting there are they of folks who buy these types of houses? But we buy a house for what? Sometimes people put so much money in their house and they can barely afford to live there. It's a status symbol. Maybe the car that you drive 
You can't afford it. You bought a $70,000 car. What's the purpose of that? You can't take it to heaven with you. Are we truly putting our identity in things that are of, not eternal, of eternal significance? I think that's what we learn in our lesson for today. So let's turn to that, shall we? First of all, a little bit of background, because it was, part of it was left out. We did get the idea that Jesus was coming to his cousin John to receive holy baptism. But let's remind ourselves, shall we, what John was doing. John was calling the people of Israel to a season of repentance and preparation, for the Messiah was about to be revealed to them. John used baptism as a sign of repentance. Now, I am going to tell you that we have a baptismal font right here, but the baptism with which we baptize today is not the same type of baptism of John. It's not a baptism of repentance in hopes that God will forgive us. The baptism that we proclaim is the baptism of Jesus Christ. It replaced the baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. It is the claim of God on our lives. God is making a claim and making a stake in your heart that you belong to him, and that's what holy baptism is. It is the difference between the baptism of John the baptism of Jesus. We don't any longer proclaim the baptism of John. We proclaim the baptism of Jesus, the claim of God on your life. But... At the time of Jesus, this was the baptism. It was a baptism of repentance. And it was not uncommon for non-Jews to participate in this ritual act of cleansing as a sign of their conversion to Judaism. But it was never an accepted thing and never done before John or after John where faithful people who were already a part of the Jewish faith to be called to repent and be baptized. That just didn't happen. Now, this was John's call. It's amazing that Jesus participated in this. Hang on a second to that. Because why would Jesus need to participate in an act of contrition? Hang on to that thought. John, by his lifestyle, did something really unique. He rejected the values of this world. Our identity is, you see, not found in any nationalistic endeavors nor is it found in any materialistic endeavors. It is found in something different, the gift that God was going to give to us in the Messiah. So John was calling people to a submission to the will of God. We are to trust that God will control our future. And see, this is the problem with this nationalistic spirit that floated through our country recently. We were putting our trust in a leader who was not worthy of our trust, there's only one leader worthy of our trust who comes and submits himself, and that's Jesus Christ. I will tell you what, that's why I'm going to say a name. That's why Donald Trump is not worthy of your honor. He did not come to submit. He came to be served by you. Jesus Christ comes and submits himself. Okay? I know some of you just turned me off. That's okay. John called for a submission to the will of God, trusting our future into the hands of God, not some political leader, and certainly not the status symbols around which we surround ourselves. God was to send one who would deliver Israel, so Israel needed to stop their striving. This is a very timely message today. There is no way for the Jews to be a light to the world as long as they were striving for control of their lives, or were consumed by things that were not of eternal significance. And this is what John was calling them, to reject the material things of this world, the powers of this world, and submit themselves to God. So, here we are, you're caught up now. Jesus is the one who was sent by God, who is now the one to whom we are called to submit. But here's the amazing thing. I told you to hang on to that thought. What did Jesus come and do? He started his ministry with an act of submission. Wait a minute. He's the leader. This is why you know a leader isn't a real leader. If they don't come to submit themselves, they're not a real leader. If they expect you to follow them, they're not a real leader. See, a leader comes and gives themselves. Stands beside his people. Walks behind his people. Makes sure they stay out of danger gives himself up for his people. I don't know too many political leaders willing to do that, do you? 
They don't represent Jesus Christ. Jesus came, he submitted himself in this baptism of repentance. And that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense to us because Jesus certainly did not need to repent, did he? However, Jesus is both our model as well as being our Savior. He's telling us, if you truly want to be a leader, how do you do it? By being a servant. If you don't have a servant heart, you're not a leader. You're just somebody wanting to surround yourself with the powers of this world. Jesus, the one who has the power to transform the entire world, submits to the power of God. His mission, therefore, is to help us to find our identity, not in the things of this world, but ultimately in God. And the only way we find our identity in God is when we start with an act of submission. So Jesus, therefore, calls us to repent. Now, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, about repentance being this religious word that we... Uh, that people hear and they just kind of cringe. Oh, repent, repent. And a lot of Christians use it like a big 50-pound uh, King James Version of the Bible and would have bashed you on the head with it. Repent, you sinner. But that's not what Jesus means. And that's not how that word is meant to be taken. Repent is, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, simply this. Oh, you're going the wrong way. Life is hurting you. It's treating you poorly. Just turn around and go this way. That's what repent means. It's turning 180 degrees from the direction you're going. If walking this way is hurting you, go the other direction. And when you go the other direction, guess who you're going to go towards? You're going to go to God. In the arms of Jesus Christ. So turn your back on the way that you're going. Again, it's not an indictment. It's an encouragement. How do we know this? Because listen to what Jesus says. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, which means good news, okay? So again, if you're unsatisfied, if you're getting hurt going in a direction, if you're living in a relationship where you're getting beat every single day, turn around and go the other direction. You don't have to stay in that type of relationship. That's kind of symbolic of life, isn't it? If we're going in a way that's beating us up, stop going that way. You're better than that. You deserve better than that. Turn to the good news. Turn to God. So that's the call of Jesus for today. And so here's what I think we learned and how we're supposed to apply this to our life in the season of Lent. Our identity should not be found in the material objects of this world. Certainly not any political leaders. Certainly not in the clothes that we wear, the house that we live in, or the car that we drive or the power that we think we have, our identity is found in Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is introduced in the world by a transformation of our hearts. We submit to the reign of God and the claim of God on our lives. Jesus, therefore, will lead us in this struggle during our Lenten journey so that we learn how to submit to him by giving up all the claim of power and the things of this world on our lives because we are called to follow his lead. So I'm encouraging this day because I think a lot of us Christians have gotten the wrong idea of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It means to submit. It means to let go of power. It means to give history and the future to God and to his care. It means to let go of all those trapments that will pull you down. doesn't mean that you don't have to. It means, sure, you can enjoy a trip and travel and vacation with your family. I'm not saying that. Yes, you can enjoy a nice home. There's nothing wrong with that. But these things are traps. They convince us that somehow this is our reason for being here, is to surround ourselves with these good things. We need to let these things go. Give them to God and submit to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our lives would be so much better if we stopped traveling in the way that would abuse us. You call us to repent, to turn our backs on those things, to give ourselves over to somebody who truly cares for us. That's what we see in Jesus Christ. We see the love of God. And so, God, we submit ourselves to you this day. 
and look forward to the rest of this Lenten journey that we might grow in a deeper and more abiding relationship with you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing together our hymn of the day. together the faith that unites us in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. How good, Lord, it is to be here in your presence this day. And we trust that wherever people are watching the service today, you would too be with them. For I am well aware that worship without the presence of the Church of Jesus Christ, still, even though you are truly present, misses something really important. And that's our other brothers and sisters. And so we look for and look for, yearn for that day where we can be reunited in our full, full fellowship to enjoy each other's companionship, to sing praises to God once again. But in that time, help us to be patient, help us to be loving, let us lift each other up in prayer. So we do lift up this world in prayer this day, God. Help us to uh, let, let go, let loose of all of that anger and all that frustration, that impatience in our lives for other people, that arrogance that we somehow think we're better. God, we are not. You love every single one of us. And it is our mission, our, I should say, opportunity and privilege to participate in the mission of Jesus Christ, which is to announce the good news to the world. So use us, God. Take away the sorrow from our lives. Wipe away the tears. 
Give us a hopefulness, God, that would translate into a joy that might be seen by others. For we know that the world is not going to know us by our sternness, by our beliefs and dogmas, but by our love. So let us again sow love and kindness and charity in this world. We pray again for those doctors and nurses, for those who've been looking after our health, the AIDS, and those who help in the hospitals. We pray your continued blessing upon them. Keep them safe. We are so grateful for their efforts on our behalf. We are so grateful for your healing that is now falling upon this world. We thank you for using all those researchers to provide that healing for us. We also lift up police officers, our men and women in the military, continue to keep them safe. We lift up this day those who struggle with cancer, for those who would despair for any cause or any reason. For we know that you hear our prayers, whatever they might be. And so we take a moment of silent prayer to lift all of those concerns to you. God, I'd like to end with a very special thanksgiving for the birth of a baby in the congregation. And so that we're thankful. You remind us for every birth that you've not given up on us. You have a future planned for us. And we are so grateful for that. And so, Lord, in your hands we commit all those for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now the God who formed us in love, renews us through grace, who will transform us into glory, Bless you this day and always. Amen. Amen. This song is just a reminder in case you're feeling overwhelmed today, as I often have been. Um, during this season. Anything I say to you about the anger and the frustration, those are things that uh, I have given into myself in recent days. And, and uh, I'm asking God to, to fight these battles for me because I trust that he, we will be victorious.
reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God.